Hi, I'm Sean Wildermuth. Welcome back to Coding Shorts. In this week's episode, I'm going to be talking about dependency injection. I've been using dependency injection for a long time, but it took me a little while to get my head around how important it was to the single responsibility principle. I'm going to show you using some simple code why it's important and why you should be using it. Let's take a look. So let's talk a little bit about how we build up objects and how dependency injection can kind of help that. Because I think some of you might be using dependency injection and it seems like one more sort of complicated step you need to deal with just to do what often can be thought of as simple things. Here I have just a top level program in C Sharp that wants to create something called a perf timer, which we'll walk through in a second, and just run that perf timer. And the perf timer is just a little class I've created that says, when you create the perf timer, give it when it starts and when it's disposed, because it supports I disposable, go ahead and just write out the difference in time. So we know how long what was inside that using statement took in milliseconds. And of course, this should be somewhere around a thousand milliseconds. But you could see how I might use this in a larger project to see how certain operations are taking as far as time. Not a brilliant idea. There are some problems with it, but I, what I want to show you is doing something that seems fairly trivial can get complicated pretty quickly. So the problem with perf timer here is that we need a logger, an object that's going to know how to write out this file we want. And so really what we want to do is create a logger here. And this is going to be a logger class I'm going to write. Don't worry about the fact that there's logger classes in core and some of the other things in core. We're going to be writing it all just so you can kind of see how it works. And so once we have our logger, we can go ahead and pass it in, and that's fine. Perf timer says, oh, good, I, I'm going to have a logger here. But of course, logger requires what? Something to write to. So we need a writer here. And how do we get that writer? I'm just going to say console open standard output. Now, of course, open standard output actually returns what? It returns a stream. So we also need a stream here. And we could put these on single lines. I'm just putting them on multiple lines so we can see all the moving pieces. And then we can say new stream writer. And there we have it, right? So if we open up a console and just say .NET run, this should work. Okay, it took 1014 point some odd milliseconds to run. There's some overhead in how this works. But for the most part, we saw that this was in the neighborhood of 1000 milliseconds, right? The problem is if we want to use this a bunch, Creating all these different objects is a lot of work to use it each and every time we want to use it. And so this is one of the problems that dependency injection tries to solve. And that is, you know what? My client code doesn't want to know how this is being written out, doesn't want to know where this is being written out or anything. I just want to be able to have a perf timer here and it go to wherever the system has told me that it's going to go out. And the standard console might be it but I don't want to have to think about it. I want the single responsibility for what perf timer does. And so this is going to involve us repeating this whole code. I'll leave it there so you can see it as a way of handling it with dependency injection. Now for this console application, introducing dependency injection isn't a huge help, right? Because we're about to create a collection and then we're going to use it right away. Normally these would be in larger projects where you're going to set up dependency injection and then use it in a bunch of places. You're going to have to take a little bit of a leap of faith with me. But we're going to do this by creating a I service collection. And I'm going to get this by bringing in the Microsoft extensions.dependency injection class namespace. This is effectively a collection that's going to allow me to add different sorts of dependencies. And this actually takes a concrete class of service collection. And if you've done ASP.NET Core or other things, you've seen this used in your own applications a bunch, but I want you to really see what's going on. So we're going to do it as simple as possible. So first, I'm going to say, you know what? I need to be able to create perf timers. So I'm going to add a transient in our case. And transient simply means it's going to get created every time it's needed, which for perf timer is exactly right. And we're just going to give it a class name, perf timer. Now, what does this do? This tells the collection later when I want to use this collection, I'm going to actually get a different object called a provider or 
can be used in other names. And I do this by going to the collection and saying, build the service provider. This effectively takes all the different services I've registered here and gives me this object that allows me to do things like using var timer equals provider get service perf timer. So what this effectively is doing is saying, hey, go look in the dependency collection I've created here and generate a new instance of perf timer for me. I'm going to let you be responsible for that. And then the rest of this code ends up being primarily the same, right? Thread.sleep1000. And this could run. It's actually going to fail because what is happening in this magic piece here where we're saying, go get me an instance of this. This is going to look in the perf timer class and do pretty much identically to what we did earlier, which is like, oh, the perf timer requires a logger. And then it's going to look in the service collection itself and go, is there a logger? And so we can go ahead and do the same thing here and add a transient logger. Same idea. When I need a logger, perf timer is going to know it needs to generate it. And it's going to create it again as a transient. It's going to generate it pretty much every time it needs. And this logger, we look at it, needs what? A stream writer. And so it's using the construction of the object to know what objects are required. Different dependency injection layers handle this a little differently, but most of them support at least constructor injection. And so because the logger needs what? A stream writer, we're going to need to do the same thing. Come here and add. In this case, I'm going to actually add a singleton, which says, you know what? You're going to create this once, and then you're going to reuse it every time. Stream writer. But here, I'm going to pass it in an instance of the stream writer in our case. And I'm effectively telling it, when you're looking for this class, use this one I'm passing into you. I could also do this as a lambda to delay its creation, but for our needs, I don't need that. And here, that can then say console.open standard error. Now, if I don't want to do that, if I just want to use the same method here, get out of here and say, I'll add singleton for stream, then I can take the stream and say, okay, whenever anyone wants a stream, give them the stream. Probably not the best idea, but for our simple example, this works. So by adding all of these, it's going to walk this chain. So my code, my individual code throughout my whole project, isn't going to need to know about how this construction happens. It just knows the service it needs, and it's going to let the dependency injection figure that out. And more importantly, when this construction changes because of underlying changes to it, none of this code needs to be touched, right? Because it's always going to know, give me this thing, and you figure out how to construct it. And so let's go ahead and run this just to prove to you that it still runs. And we can see it ran in pretty much a similar time. You really can't depend exactly on these numbers being matched. It's not that this is slower than this in any case. It really is that you get the luck of the draw sometimes with how long something takes. But let's talk about a different case. Let's say we wanted to have different experiences for different users. So instead of using the logger here, let's go to our perf timer, and I'm going to change this to be an interface called iLogger, right? All I want to do is I want to have a logger here that if we look at this is just how to write the message. That's all I need to know. And we've actually implemented two versions of this. One is a file logger that knows about what it needs, right? It needs that file stream and the stream writer, et cetera, so it can write to a file. Or we also have the console logger that takes in a stream and does the same sort of thing. So they're very similar, but they both more importantly, implement this interface. And this is something you're going to run into quite a lot. So I want to say iLogger here, but the concrete class is going to be what? Let's say console logger. So this is saying, when you create this, I need this class. This is the object that I need you to pass into me on construction. And I'm telling you which of the concrete classes to actually use and construct. If I've done this right we can see it still works, right? Because this console logger is depending on a stream coming in, and then it sort of hides the stream writer. In fact, we don't need the stream writer in here at all because inside our implementation of console logger, we've simplified it by saying, I know what I need, and I need a stream, which in this case is the console, 
to write this. And in fact, this could be all hidden. The console logger could do the simple work of console.open standard output because it knows it wants to write directly to the console. And then the console logger has no dependencies in this case. So let's go back to program. And so we don't really even need this. Now, why would we do this? Why does this matter? Well, it matters because if we had, I'm going to use a brute force of if debug else. We can have multiple versions of this, right? So let's say here in not debug, we want to use the file logger. Same interface. None of this code needs to change, but we can decide which implementation we want to use. But of course, the file logger requires a file stream. And so here, when we add the support, we can also optionally add the add singleton file stream. And where are we going to get it? We're going to say file open. And we'll call it log.text. And we'll just say file mode.create because we want it to create the file every time we run this application, right? And so in this case, when the file logger is used, when we're not running in debug, we'll go ahead and get a file with all this information, but none of the resulting code that needs just a perf timer here needs to ever know about any of those, right? We can hide those details of implementation so we don't have to change them every time we change the requirements of something deep in the system. So the work of actually setting this up, even though different dependency injection layers do it in different ways, is something you're going to want to do during startup of a particular application. But then throughout the application, you're just going to be either asking instances to be provided using the service provider, or more likely, you're just going to write your classes with whatever you need as injectable services. So if I needed a file stream here, I'd suddenly get that file stream injected for me. I don't have to think about how it's constructed. I can just add this as a requirement and it'll magically be injected anytime the perf timer is created. And so it allows me to not have to think about how this is created or where it is. It isolates my code so that all the code I'm writing is as simple as possible. We're putting these things together using dependency injection. I hope this helped you understand why you're doing this extra work with dependency injection and why once you get used to it and you really understand the power, you probably won't ever want to go back. I certainly didn't. This has been Sean Wildermuth for Coding Shorts. Thanks again.